All right, make him sign a signature. Let's go. <laughs> John Smoltz. Welcome to Baseball Stories. Thank you. You know, I know that some people remember you as a starter. Some people remember you as a reliever. I remember you as a brave. Yeah. <laughs> but not just any brave. If I, if I have this right, I believe you're the only guy who was there for the first division title in 1991. Yeah. And here's a fly ball hit to right field. This may do it. Justice is back. It's over. The Braves win it. And we're still around for the 14th in a row in 2005. The Braves have done it again, 14 in a row. I always used to say, you know, like, <laughs> how did I not get voted off the island? You know, like Survivor. Uh, that was a guy that myself got traded to the organization, guys like Glavin and all the homegrown talent that they had. You know, we never envisioned that I would be the last standing one, but that's exactly right. You know, the fact that I got to play my whole career with Bobby Cox for the most part and survived that whole time frame from losing to winning and then transitioning, obviously, to one day not winning that 15th year um, was amazing. All right, so 14 division titles in a row. What's the legacy of that team? What should it be? And what was your place in that legacy? We knew as a young team that if we're going to turn this around, it's going to start with pitching. And we saw the farm system building and what Bobby had done and drafted and traded for. But yet we weren't winning, right? And so then when we started winning, we felt that we could do this for a while. And never did anyone dream it would be 14 years. I, I think to a man, everyone thought that there was about a three to four year period where we should not have won. And we, sh we were still expected to win the World Series in that year we weren't, weren't supposed to win. So it looks like a, a negative when you only win one championship. If you take each individual year and separate it by itself, so many things happened that, that gave us an opportunity to win that we did not execute. That's right. the difference between four rings, five rings, and one ring. So our legacy is something that we will be appreciative of the opportunities. Nothing like this will ever happen again. There's no chance a team wins 14 divisions in a row. Um, but yet we realize we should have won more rings. You pitch with two guys, three Hall of Famers, together for a decade. You know, Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz is the way most people remember it. We're right. going to refer to it in this show as Smoltz, Maddox, Glavin, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay? How close were you three guys? How great were you three? Our personalities mixed real well. You know, we were very competitive in our own way. I think Tommy and I grew up in kind of the same kind of the country, part of the country, the Midwest, Eastern part of the country, blue collar, kind of work ethic guys. Then we added Maddox, who had already brought over his credentials uh, before we got him, and, and our personalities fit well there. And I was kind of the ringleader. You know, I was the yeah, concierge, you if you will, <laughs> set it all up. And, and as Greg put it, you know, we learned how to have fun away from the game that was really consuming us. I don't know that we could have ever imagined what it was going to be like with the three of us as far as the numbers we all collectively put up. I'll be frank and honest, I was, I was holding them down from the potentials that were out there because I know that people picked me to win the Cy Young a lot, that I had the stuff and maybe didn't have the numbers they had for the longest time. But I guess for me, the, the postseason was my part you know, my way of being able to kind of check in. And then we all had the pride that we didn't want to miss starts. We all had the pride in our work ethic away from the game. And um, I think we never talked about anything of, of togetherness, like, hey, we can do this, we can do that. That's the most, if people would, that's the most amazing thing that we never talked about what we could do together. We just did it. And every year they said we wouldn't be able to do it. And we did it again. <laughs> And I, I think Stan Kasten put it best when he was our GM and president. When he was our president of the club, he said, the hardest task I had was, can you guys keep doing this the older you get? And he said, I was amazed to know that you guys could and kept doing it. All right, well, let's look back on it now. Let's think about it. Three Hall of Fame starters in the same rotation for a decade. Like we talk about now, this is the greatest rotation in baseball. And these rotations stay together for a year yeah. or two. You were together for 10. Will we ever see anything like that again? No, no chance. Um, no chance. And I understand why. I mean, no, that this game has drastically changed. Uh, it used to be, and maybe, you know, maybe we'll get back to this, but if I drafted you, I wanted you for as long as I could be. I, I don't think that exists as much today with the economics that are involved. And together, we were able to do something that, you know, we look back and we go, wow, uh, that, that was not only fun, it was incredible and we have the time of our lives.
I look back at the film and I see my disgust and I see like, how can you be taking me out right here? And Smoltz delivered. Brad coming in, he's there. John Smoltz has a new National League record. That is his 54th save of the year. You kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, Maddox and Glavin won the Cy Youngs, and every year people would still say, but John Smoltz has the best stuff in that group. Yeah. Now, I always thought of that mostly as a compliment, but it sounds like you thought maybe there were some other plot lines swirling around. Yeah, it. you know, expectation can be, uh, can be tough, especially if you don't reach your own expectation. I think I exceeded what I thought I could do based on the limitations I had. And then when I was finally healthy, uh, the year I, I went to spring training, in 1996, and I, you know, somewhat, I'm not a cocky person, so this might have caught them by, uh, by guard, off guard. I said, I'm going to win Cy Young this year. I remember that. Uh, and I, I said, it, Maddox's run is over. I, I, and the coach, <laughs> I told all the coaches, I said, this is my year. It's the first spring training and first offseason. I did not have to rehab like crazy. And, um, you know, I don't know how many people believe me, but I had a belief in myself. I, I, I really did, and it, it magically happened. I, I won the Cy Young. Pitched almost 300 innings, and it was an eyelash away from the dream year of winning our second World Series championship. Well, if that was your year, then October was your month. Right. Uh, I mean, you pitched over 200 innings just in the postseason, 15 and four, with a 2.67 ERA. I, I went pouring through the uh, postseason annals. Nobody in history has ever won that many games, had that great a winning percentage, had that good an ERA. What was it about you that allowed you to be that guy in the biggest games of your life? Yeah, I think, you know, it's not as simple as saying I wanted it, because a lot of people want it. But I think the biggest thing is the belief that I had when I was seven years old all the way up. I put myself in every imaginable scenario you can imagine. I dreamt of this. I believed in it. I would pitch seven games as a kid. And I think that's part of the DNA that exists within me that I wanted the ball. I wanted to make the shot. I wasn't afraid to fail. That is my mantra, I was not afraid to fail. And if you're not afraid to fail and you, can, and you can live with the consequences, then I think you can be at your greatest. This is the way I would categorize it for me. In the regular season, I tried to win a lot of games, but I never put the emphasis or effort that I did in a postseason game because I would have never made it through the regular season. So in other <laughs> words, effort-wise, three times as great in the postseason than is the regular season. I think there's only one bad game I ever had in the postseason. And you, that's the one thing that I'm more proud of that every single chance I gave my ch a team a chance to win with the exception of one time. And, um, you know, if you ask me, I would give up a lot of what I've accomplished to have more postseason appearances because that's how special it is and that's how much I, I relish the opportunity. I mean, you had some epic October moments. We'll, we'll show you one later when we roll the monitor out here. But I, I, I have to ask you about the Morris game. Game 7, 91 World Series. And you know, I, I was looking through this today, John. Um, there have only been 11 pitchers in history mm -hmm. that pitched seven and a third shutout innings or more in Game 7 of the World Series. You're the only one that didn't get a win out of it. Yeah. Does that, when you look back on that game now, does it feel almost unfair the way it turned out? The Twins are going to win the World Series. The Twins have won it. It's a base hit. It's a one-nothing, ten-inning victory. Yeah, first of all, I'm a blessed man, so I don't want this to come across <laughs> like, you know, oh, he's complaining about. No, I'm, I, I, I've pitched three seventh games in my career. Gave up two total runs. Right. And have one win. Right. So baseball sometimes doesn't follow the way you think it's going to follow. And I believe that I could have kept pitching in that game, by the way. But I wasn't old enough, and I didn't have enough experience to tell my manager to <laughs> scooty off the mound. But honestly, that was the place I, I enjoyed the most. Game seven, the anticipation of it, um, everyone knowing what it meant. Uh, I took a big nap that day, right, right at the park, right on the training room table. Missed, uh, you know, Ted Turner's speech and all the different things that went on because I was so comfortable about what I was about to do. And, wow. And honestly... I look back at the film and I see my disgust and I see like, how can you be taking me out right here? I was so locked into the game that I'm, unfortunately the only trouble I got in, the only trouble I got in was the inning I had, to, yeah. I had to leave. I was lucky enough to be there that night. I can still remember 
how I felt. Uh, every single pitch was, uh, was such a pulsating experience. Mm -hmm. What's it like to be the man on the mound in that moment? Well, it, first of all, it was the loudest stadium I've ever been in. Yeah. And the, the, the volume, because there's a roof, uh, stayed right there. And my, my whole ambition was to keep it to a dull roar and to hear this small buzz instead of this. Because if you were going to hear the crowd, that meant runners were on. It meant, you know, things were not going good. So I, throughout the entire game, never felt, I never heard the crowd at all to the point that when I got taken out, I heard it very vividly because now I know. How, how could you not hear it? Well, because I was in, I really, you know, people talk about being in a zone. I was locked in with the, with the task that I had. I had played this out in my mind already so many different times. And Greg Olson and I were in such a good sequence, in such a good place. Remember, I, I was 2-11. And, and that year break, I, right? I was at the break and I was a couple starts away from being removed from as a starter. Wow. And I go on this unbelievable second half and pitch the clincher at the regular season, nine innings, and he comes and jumps in my arm. I pitch the seventh game on the road in Pittsburgh, nine innings, no runs, he jumps in my arms. I knew it was going to happen again. I was going to pitch nine innings on the road in Minnesota. He was going to jump in my arms for the basically third time, and this was going to be the year that, you know, we shocked everybody. And... When that gets taken and you hadn't given up a run and you're going, so it was, it was an amazing feeling, but I remember sitting on the, the, the dugout, being the last one there, just taking it in, seeing what Minnesota went through, seeing the icon of Jack Morris that I had idolized my entire career. Right. Grew uh, up in Mi Michigan, in Tigers Miami. fan. Tigers fan, and I said, one day that'll be us. One day I want to know what that's, that, that feeling feels like. Wow. Um, yeah, it, it's just so unjust that you're the other guy in that mm. game. There have been uh, a few of those, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, it comes with the business, but this was game seven yeah. of the World Series. Will we see that kind of game seven ever again in our lifetime? Two great starting pitchers out there, nothing but zeros on the board, eighth inning. I doubt it. I, I, the, the stars would have to align for the right guy. That field is getting so small. Those field of pitchers who can put aside the noise of what numbers and analytics tell you. And, and, and it would have to be a special guy that could tell your manager, I ain't coming out of this game no matter what you say. I think that is, that, that's the dying breed of, of, of starters that we came to know and love and, and appreciated. And um, for me now, sitting and doing games and watching it, it saddens me because that role has been diminished so much. And more importantly, that role has been filled with an injury plague that this new style of baseball was supposed to prevent right. is saddening to me even more. And you think about the what is, if I walk across the curb and roll my ankle, I knew they were gonna blame golf. I've never taken a lesson, I don't practice, I just play. To say I'm having the time of my life is uh, an understatement right now. I want to ask you about a different kind of sporting pressure. If people are watching this, they've seen you play in the U.S. Senior Open. How did the pressure of doing that compare to those October moments? Yeah, in that it's pressure? not actually. It's not even close. I, I it was so much for, more pressure. More pressure. Yeah, this is a sport <laughs> that I love, that I want to play, but I haven't been able to devote, you know, the time I devoted to baseball. So the reps in baseball made me much more comfortable with the pressure I was dealing with than per se the golf that can expose you immediately uh, when you step on a course. I've never put on any ice skates. So I'm not gonna sit here and go, oh, I could ice skate. Give me a year and I can go ice skate. I'm not gonna say stuff like that. But what I will say is I believe that I could play golf at the next level at some capacity, not full time, not with these guys on a daily basis. But when I was in my latter 30s and you know approaching 40, I told all my teammates, one day you're gonna see me on the senior tour. And you know how if you're with guys long enough, they're like, whatever, <laughs> move away. And, and I got a lot of texts from those guys saying, by God, you said you're going to do it. Yeah. You know, I, I know a lot of pitchers who are afraid to play golf. That I might get hurt. I might have a blister. To hear you talk about baseball and golf almost interchangeably in this conversation, it feels like they're missing something, that yeah. golf taught you lessons that helped you in baseball. No doubt. When you take an athlete and you put them in a box, you, you just ruin that person. My off-season training was basketball. I stayed in shape with basketball. That would I know, never happen. I know Cal Ripken, that was the same thing. Yeah. I know that you know, it was with controlled guys. It wasn't that something couldn't happen. But if you live in a bubble, if you never are able to do anything, 
and you think about the what is. If I walk across the curb and roll my ankle, I knew they were going to blame golf. And matter of fact, at points in my career when I was struggling, golf. Like people will point to whatever they can to justify their, their own means, but they don't really understand the player, the mindset, my mentality, my manager did. Even my general manager didn't. Trust me, we had our battles. It was like, how can you do this when you're the closer? I said, let me just break it down to you this way. When I tell you how many times I actually hit a golf ball and how many times I'm putting and chipping, it's really not a strenuous sport. <laughs> and when I tell you that I can't get three outs at 10 o'clock at night when I'm done playing golf at 12 and have the rest of the day to do, then I'm not your man. And, and that put it all to bed. After one year of 55 saves, I had people questioning whether I should even be allowed outside, yet alone play golf. And 55 saves later, no one ever said another word. Yeah. All right, all right, one more golf question. I know you've played a lot of golf with Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. What's your most memorable round with Tiger Woods? Mm -hmm. The memorable round, just to speak of how competitive he was, we had a fivesome. We get to the fifth hole, it was a par three, and the scar scorecard read five, four, three, two, one. So every number was covered by the fivesome. Whoa. My buddy got the hole in one. Whoa. And so I picked it out of the hole and I said, Scott was my buddy's name. I said, Scott, what's more believable when we get back home? The fact that you got a hole in one or beat Tiger by four on one <laughs> hole. <laughs> well, Tiger let me have it. At that point, he had a couple signs for me and he, and, and, and oh, he really? went, uh, I believe he went 12 <laughs> under in the next 22 holes. Oh, no. We played 27 Only 12 under? under? Yeah, only 12 yes. under. He yeah, went to the next level. Right, let, let's do a little segment we call film study. All right, let's show you some magical moments from your life and times. All right. Let's start with a game in which you struck out 15 expos. Yeah. Right? You remember this one, don't I you? I do 1992? remember it. I was in a pretty good zone. The, Breaking ball was working. They had a pretty good team. I loved pitching in Montreal, actually. Conditions were perfect. When I didn't do well, you see the plexiglass behind the when we show a batter? I found myself watching my mechanics in that. That meant I wasn't going to have a good game. See these plexiglass? Yeah, like you can it. see yourself, and that's not a good thing, but I, I did get Gary Carter four times, and wow, um, I was locked in. Yeah, it you really well, felt good. I mean, you tied Warren Spahn's Braves, all-time Braves record for a nine-inning yeah. game. Warren Spahn. It's amazing. You know, Montreal was also another place in 96 where I was able to break Phil Necro's uh, victories in a season. Uh, so Montreal has some, some special places yeah, for Yeah, it really me. does. All right, now let's take a, a look at a game that uh, it, it might be your greatest postseason memory, right? This is game seven of the 91 NLCS. Yeah, first time I get it put in this position, and obviously this is the, the game that gets us to our first World Series. And I was really at a good place until we scored three in the top of the first. And what I mean by that is, when you're in a position to win a game seven, you just envision it's going to be 0-0 zero, zero the whole time. <laughs> right. And then you're given three runs. And I, uh, I, I remember the ride to the park. I remember, you know, getting at the game after Steve Avery's heroic one nothing victory game before. And, you know, these, this is the one feel-good place for me. I pitched a lot of big, big games that didn't always end up on the, on the winning end. Yeah. And this, for no other reason of itself, I started it and finished it. There were some tense moments. Van Slyke, not in this particular one, hit one deep, but in the first inning he hit one deep that I thought was a game tire. And I wow. remember Olsen coming out and saying, are you okay? I said, now I am, the game's over. That was in the first. Wow. And then facing Barry Bonds was always something that, you know, I, I, I knew was the ultimate battle. And there was a couple moments I got him out. And the right-handers didn't give me as much fits when I had my curveball working. But Barry right here, being able to get him to, to hit a couple weak ones and then a pop-up later in the game, um, each, every inning I pitched, I believe I was getting closer and closer to having uh, the team, you know, celebrate. And I never, never got carried away, which was the one thing after the first inning. I, I never felt like I wasn't in control. Um, it's like you were pardoned by the governor or something? Yeah. That first <laughs> inning I was nervous. And, and I know, I know they, they felt it. Right here was a big moment, you know, getting him to pop up was always something, keeping him in the park rather than yeah. hitting it out of the park. So. I, uh, I could relive this moment right here for the rest of my life, uh, never anticipating, you know, what would happen next. And, of course, Greg jumps in my arm, and, and I know that this is a work that, as every starting pitcher's dream, you want to finish it. You don't want to turn it over to anybody. And afterwards, the excitement, this just could last forever. All right, let's do a few quick hits. 
Tony Gwynn, 75 plate appearances against you. He had 444. You struck him out once. Yeah. How is that possible? Well, I know I struck him out more than once, but to his credit, he got a few calls in his day. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I do have my one favorite story of, of Tony Gwynn. I had a no-hitter going in the eighth inning with two outs in San Diego. Ryan Klesko was playing right field, learning how to play right field. Tony Gwynn hit a ball that was going towards the track, but Rhino had kind of tracked it and hit his glove and dropped it. So I knew it was an error. And I heard the crowd go crazy. And I turned around and on the board was a double and on the second base was Tony with a grin like, welcome to San Diego. <laughs> uh, and I, went, I was furious. I just knew that I had been robbed of a no hitter. And every time I saw Tony at a card show or anywhere I saw him, I said, Really? Like <laughs> 3,000 whatever and something minus one and he would just chuckle and, and know that, that, that he had earned that uh, reputation and uh, that double that I thought was an error. Yeah. If there's one word that would describe you that you would want people to talk about when your name comes up, what would mm. that be? Wow. You can, go, you can go five words if you want. <laughs> no, I, I like reliable. You can count on me. Um, in whatever facet that is, whether it's a teammate, a person, or a player. Like, you can, you can feel rest assured, you can count on me that I'm going to give you everything I have and not be phony about it and not be corny about it. Because to me, I was raised the right way. I respect everything that, that I've been able to do. I don't take anything for granted. Um, and I respected that uniform. That uniform to me represented not only the team I was playing for, but you know, my dad, my family, my last name. And so for me, I never understood whether we play a, a game of cards or putt-putt, or I don't understand why people can't give their best. Like, I don't understand why you wouldn't want to beat me or why you're just going through the motions. And, and I, I see that in a lot of different ways. Um, and I'm not talking about life's too serious and every moment is a game seven. I'm just saying, why would you not want to give your best in whatever you're doing to the best of your capacity? capability and um, that's kind of the way I felt when I put on a uniform whatever I had you were going to get the very best of that that day well that's a that's a great way to be and I think we've we've seen it here today John thank you very much for Appreciate doing this it. thank you for having me